Aloha, my name is Noah Kekueva Lincoln, a researcher with the University of Hawaii at Maunoa. Um, and I really work on our indigenous crops and cropping systems, understanding how our ancestors utilized uh, the landscape of Hawaii for food production in the past and today. Agriculture in Hawaii before Western contact was extremely diverse. Uh, we often talk about how Hawaii is one of the most ecologically diverse, uh, ecologically dense places on the planet. Here on Hawaii Island alone, we have two thirds of the Holdridge life zones uh, uh, on, our, on our island. What we don't talk about is how our ancestors had to adapt their usage of the landscape to that extremely diverse ecology. So while Hawaii is the most ecologically diverse place on the planet, our ancestors probably had the most diverse agroecological forms on the planet as well. And so as you traveled around the island and around the archipelago, there is a tremendous diversity of practices, of cropping systems that our ancestors utilized in these different ecological zones. So for instance, on our windward locations where you get deep river valleys with nice flowing water, you get our, our most uh, well-known form of agriculture, the lo'ikalo, um, terraced agricultural forms for taro production that may have looked a lot like rice paddies elsewhere in the world. Um, but as you come around to the uh, leeward slopes of the island where our soils are, are more fertile, uh, rainfall is more moderate, you got vast dry land systems with, with large stone walls separating cultivated fields. Uh, in some of the barren landscapes, in, in almost pure lava rock, you saw adaptations of, of little pukas, little holes in the lava that were cultivated with sweet potato, um, or the creation of rock mounds that preserved soil moisture and allowed our ancestors to grow in some extremely dry and desolate locations. Um, on the wetter slopes of the mountains where our soils were more depleted and infertile, we saw vast agroforestry systems where our ancestors utilized tree crops um, uh, that enhanced the natural fertility of the land and allowed them to cultivate these less fertile soils. Uh, we saw the unique creation of large-scale aquaculture, near-shore aquaculture with great uh, ocean walls that corralled in uh, shallow ocean areas and allowed for the cultivation of fish and limu, uh, seaweeds. Um, and that's just scratching the surface. There was a tremendous diversity of, of cropping systems and forms across our islands. And all of this was done with a fairly small suite of crops. Our ancestors only brought a couple dozen agricultural crops with them. And with these small amount of crops, they created a tremendous varietal diversity. Um, by some accounts, there were some 350 varieties of taro alone in our islands that were uniquely adapted to these different systems. Some that might be tolerant to brackish water and could be grown in the, the nearshore area. Um, some that would be adapted to cold elevations and could be cultivated higher up on the slopes. And again, everything in between. Um, it's truly amazing the, the level of adaption and evolution that our ancestors did here in the islands. So ag changed dramatically after European contact in Hawaii. Uh, most severely, you know, the entire socio-ecological system of our ancestors collapsed, uh, introduced diseases, heavily depopulated the, the Hawaiian people. Um, by some estimates, over 90% of our population um, died off due to introduced diseases. And this um, caused a massive decline in the labor force that, that maintained our traditional ag systems. And so many of those traditional ag systems went into disrepair, went into abandonment along with the population. And then into that void moved the colonial powers um, that brought in large-scale plantation-based agriculture. And so very rapidly, you know, by the mid-1800s, you had vast um, plantations of sugarcane, of pineapple, 
that were established in the islands um, and basically became the norm for the following century after that. And now we find Hawaii in another transition. So starting in the 1970s, we saw the decline of the plantations uh, until recently in the 2000s, uh, the closure of the last sugar plantation in the state on Maui. And now we have these vast areas that were occupied for a century by these large scale export industries um, that are now gone. And in many ways, I feel that Hawaii's current state um, is really a rather uh, fragmented, uh, undefined, uh, ambiguous state where we're searching for what's going to fill the void of those plantations, but haven't clearly defined what our path forward is. So a lot of our work uses islands as a model system for understanding how humans and our environment interact. And of course, one of the most fundamental ways that human societies um, uh, coexist with our environment is through agriculture. You know, the modification of our landscapes to produce the things that, that we need, our foods, our medicine, our timbers, our fibers. And Island systems are amazing for understanding that because they were isolated systems. Um, island cultures, for the most part, had to live within their resources on their island and figure out how to make that work. And if it didn't work, you had very little land to, to deal with. It's not like a continent where if, if you failed, you could pick up and move on down the road. If you move on down the road on an island, you end up right back where you started from. And I feel this has tremendous lessons to offer humanity today. I feel our global society is, is just coming to the realization that our earth is an island, that we are um, within a finite resource limited environment and we have to uh, learn to, to live within those means, to work with the land, to work with our earth, um, to provide what we need for, but also protect that which provides for us. So I think there's a lot of ways that students can get involved today. Um, as, as people have become more aware of our environmental and social issues, there's been a tremendous proliferation of, of nonprofits and, and progressive farms that, that seek to address a lot of these issues. Um, but for me, still the most fundamental way to get involved is to get involved with your place. Um, to get involved in the land of your place and help to take care of that land, to get involved in your community and start building relationships, building those discussions, um, and start driving solutions forward for your particular place. I feel a lot of people today uh, and students, uh, the problems are so big, we want to come up with the magic bullet, right? Everybody wants that one solution that's going to solve the world's problems. Um, but for me, that one solution, that one global solution, is the local solution. And if everybody focused on their place, getting involved in their place and making their location better, that's the solution that will make a better world.